Okay, so this panel is um, a science-based panel. Um, we've got an interesting group of panelists. Um, is on. Um, and many of the things they're going to talk about have been touched on in the earlier panels, but you know, we'll have a more scientific or more research perspective on some of those issues that you've already heard about. We'll have the same format as the first panel. I'll introduce the panelists. They'll give us about five minutes of comments um, related to their work and its importance to the Great Lakes. Um, and then after all of the panelists have completed uh, their presentations, we will open uh, the floor to questions. And um, there are still lots of those white cards about. Uh, so when a question occurs to you, write it down, legibly please, because I have to read them, uh, and then hand them to uh, one of the people walking through the aisles. So uh, the first panelist is Dr. Marcelo Graziano. He's a member of the CMU Institute for Great Lakes Research and an assistant professor in the Department of Geography. And you guys changed your name, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Geography and Environmental Studies. That's correct. Uh, Dr. Graziano earned his PhD from the University of Connecticut in 2014. This panel is making me very depressed, <laughs> remembering when I got my PhD. Um, and Dr. Graziano is an economic geographer who specializes in reg regional economics and energy geography. His current research interests include modeling the socioeconomic benefits of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the development of regional data center for Great Lakes crude oil industry, and developing new measures for characterizing the rural urban divide. So with that, Dr. Graziano. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ian. And Thank you for uh, inviting me today here. Uh, can you all hear me fine? Good. <laughs> it's good they can't hear you. Okay, great. Better? Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Ian. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you also for including uh, eco an economic geographer into the um, pantheon of science. Um, sometimes economists are a little bit left uh, out of that. Um, so, uh, in terms of science, uh, I want to give you a brief uh, uh, introduction of what we're doing here at CMU um, and uh, what I've been doing uh, since I joined CMU uh, in, 20, in 2016. Um, we are working, and I say we, I um, mean myself and Dr. Matt Leish, who's in the audience today, and partners at the University of Michigan on something that I think is really relevant to the sustainability of the Great Lakes, and that is uh, assessing the socioeconomic benefits benefits of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative (GLRI). Uh, people earlier today mentioned uh, that federal initiative multiple times. Um, what we have been asked to do is to basically sa say um, how much money, how many jobs, um, uh, and what is the demographic impacts. What are the tangible benefits, tangible from a budgetary perspective that that federal program has brought to the region as a whole. Um, this is um, a research that uh, we are completing now. Uh, we actually are done with phase one. Um, we're gonna release the specific numbers in the next couple of weeks uh, with our partners. And uh, what I can tell you for, uh, as of now, however, is that the impact of GLRI, um, I think has been great on the uh, region's economy, especially considering and that's not an economic program. GLRI was designed to clean up the mess of a hundred years of uh, misuse of the Great Lakes, was not um, an economic recovery program per se yet. Uh, without giving out specific numbers, the cost for creating a single job from that particular program um, was actually in line and sometimes cheaper than federal programs that are designed to create employment. And certainly cheaper than uh, private investors uh, that ask uh, for tax breaks to generate jobs in the region. Um, 
And on top of that, uh, what we found, what myself have found and, and Dr. Leisha found uh, going around the region and interviewing stakeholders from a few selected locations, we found out that the program itself has allowed several communities to uh, regenerate themselves greatly, to relaunch themselves and uh, to open up uh, a new future that they have lost, uh, that they didn't have faith into uh, before. Uh, creating new investment opportunities and, and, and whatnot. Uh, on top of that, we're also working uh, on uh, creating an international um, sort of data hub for uh, studying and understanding better uh, issues related to transporting crude oil across the Great Lakes and possibly other fossil fuels. And that's uh, something that it's a uh, follow-on from research we started uh, a year and a half ago, um, ba uh, mainly because we found out over the past year that there are a lot of uh, things we don't know about the crude oil industry, really. Um, there, is, uh, there are a lot of talks about Enbridge 5, closing it, uh, replacing it, and whatnot, but we can't even answer basic questions such as what and how much goes through Line 5 or the entire Great Lakes pipeline system. Uh, we don't have, many times, reports, official reports and so forth, don't include jurisdictional limitations. Basically, uh, the big words just to say, uh, we close line five tomorrow morning and we say the alternative is a pipeline through Wisconsin. Who is we? Is Wisconsin gonna be fine with that? Is Canada gonna be fine with that? Who's gonna pay for it? Reports usually don't address that. That's, that's considered politics. Uh, so all that is something we are working on here at CMU and with partners, as I said, other universities, including universities in Canada. And uh, we hope to contribute further to the increased sustainability for the Great Lakes, not just for the environment, not just ecological sustainability, uh, but the lives of the people residing here, um, which are part of the environment uh, themselves. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Daria Kluver. Um, she's a member, also a member of the CMU Institute for Great Lakes Research and an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, Dr. Kluver obtained her PhD in climatology from the University of Delaware in 2011. Her research focuses on the variability of North American snowfall, including seasonal scale climatic influences on snowfall and precipitation, and regional climatic modeling to evaluate the distribution of precipitation events. Her most recent publication in the International Journal of Climatology documents the correlation between Arctic ice cover and North American snowfall. With that, Doria. How's the picture? Yeah, sure. Hello. Okay, while Jessica is getting the slides started, um, I'll just start talking because I can talk about this for a really long time and I'm gonna try really hard to keep it to just five minutes. So first of all, just in case you didn't know, the climate is still changing. Even though we're not really talking about it, climate change is still a thing. So for example, the 2016 summary of last year's climate, now that the entire year is, is finished, has showed that 2016 was the warmest year on record globally, and we have a 150-year record. Uh, we also saw the largest annual increase in CO2 observed last year, and we have a 58-year observational record for that. Oh, good, we have pictures now. So I, this is supposed to be state of the climate, or in my mind, state of the climate, state of the science. So I'm gonna give you just a very brief state of the climate and then a snippet of some of the research that I've been doing that I think might be relevant. Let's see, oh, and um, the, I'm gonna focus on temperature and precipitation because temperature impacts the Great Lakes via especially evaporation and also through lake surface water temperatures. And then I'm gonna show you precipitation data because precipitation, whether it's liquid as rain or solid as snow, are the water inputs 
into the lakes, whether that's directly or whether it's over land or through groundwater. So the first figure I have to show you is um, global land and ocean temperature anomalies. For those of you who don't know, an anomaly is just the difference from average. So in these figures, a positive anomaly is warmer than average, and a negative anomaly is colder than average. And I just grabbed last month, so September 2017. So for global land and ocean, um, anomalies show that September, last September was the fourth warmest September on record. And this record goes back to 1880. And that's after 2015, 2016, and 2014. If we uh, look to, to the year to date, so January to September, it was the second warmest January to September on record. Um, let's see, we can have the next slide. I think I have precipitation. Oh, no, I, I put the time series up here for you. These are also anomalies. So positive numbers are warmer than average. Negative numbers are colder than average. And this is just showing September and how we're ranked. Um, so you can see fourth warmest September. OK, next slide, please. I also put up uh, September precipitation. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, for Michigan, our September was the fifth driest on record. And I don't know about you guys, but like my tomato plants did not do very well. All of my garden <laughs> kind of died this year. Um, for the upper Midwest in general, it was the 28th driest on record. Again, these records go back to the uh, 1885, I think. Uh, next slide, please. No, I think that you went back one, maybe? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You were totally right, Jessica. Um, so then I thought, okay, well, let's zoom in on North America. Because, you know, I was showing you global data. So maybe that's um, making it seem warmer than we would experience in the Great Lakes. So if we zoom in on North America, um, just the land mass, last September was the fifth warmest on record. And that's for January through September. Also notice on the time series, it's more variable. So land heats up and cools down faster than water. So when you just look at data that includes land only, you're going to see more ups and downs. But still, we have the fifth highest um, temperature on record. All right, next slide, please. We continue to zoom in to the continental US. We had um, the third warmest January through September on record. The upper Midwest had the eighth warmest on record. Next slide, please. Um, precipitation for the continental US. Uh, again, I had said this before, it was the fifth driest September on record for Michigan and 28th driest for the entire upper Midwest. All right, next slide, please. So now that was sort of just general. This is how the climate is changing right now. To zoom in a little bit on my own research, I've done a number of different projects, and I just chose one, Snowfall, to share with you all. So um, a paper that I did oh, a couple years ago, I was looking at snowfall events, how frequently we get snowfall. And originally, I started doing this because I was interested in having to spend money on plowing and maintaining the roads, so very practical. And um, I identified things that we could use to forecast snowfall ahead of time very large things like El Nino. So we all know when there's an El Nino year, you know, snowfall in Michigan is different. Um, what I found that there were some drivers of snowfall frequency that we didn't know, and one of them was Arctic sea ice. So this was crazy. Why would Arctic sea ice be impacting our snow? So the figure I have here is showing regional snowfall where I group together snow stations that change in the same way, in the same pattern. So basically, this means that the storm tracks are the same that are bringing snow to these stations. So you can see that in the Great Lakes region, we have a couple of different groups of stations. So these are impacted by different storm tracks. And I'm going to show you data from the top group. It's the dark purple, region seven. 
and um, this is impacting sort of the western Great Lakes area, and it's highly influenced by the location of Alberta clipper type storms. So we all know when we're going to get a good Alberta clipper, cold air mass, and snowfall. Well, I get really excited when we're getting those. So um, let's see, next slide. I think if you hit, yeah, here we go. Okay, so what I was looking at was how the distribution of snowfall changes in this region over time. And I should mention, this data is measured by people. They go outside with a stick and measure snow. So like it's not something somebody made up. Like People are out there measuring it with rulers. So anyway, um, we've seen that the number of snowfall events is increasing, but it's not just the average. The higher, the higher snowfall years are getting even larger, and the smallest snowfall years are larger than they used to be. So it's not just average. So the entire distribution is changing, which I find is very interesting. So next, next, please. So um, back to that snowfall and plowing research I was doing, uh, we found that the Arctic was a, f a driver. We could use it up to the summer before to forecast some percentage of snowfall. And this is uh, maybe cause for alarm because the Arctic is changing a lot. So I looked at Arctic sea ice to just sort of uh, focus on that one variable. I looked at different parts of the Arctic and the Arctic sea ice, and I used that um, in a lead lag relationship. So several months ahead, looking at Arctic and then trying to forecast what the snowfall was going to be doing in the US. I think next, oh, okay, I didn't have a picture of it. So anyway, <laughs> um, I found that for the Great Lakes area, um, the fall snowfall, so September, October, and November, was best described by Arctic sea ice extent in the Kara Sea from the previous spring. So this is really cool because it means that there's a memory mechanism. Okay, so what's happening in the Arctic in the spring is impacting precipitation here the next fall. So um, the way we think this happens is that with less ice, you're going to warm the ocean and the near surface atmosphere. So if you have a warmer Arctic, there's less of a temperature gradient between the pole and the equator. And the temperature gradient is what controls where your jet streams are, where your pressure centers are, and where your storm tracks are. So there's the connection, and it can take months to happen because we're over very large distances on the Earth. So the reason why I wanted to show this and describe my um, snow research rather than some of my more uh, Great Lakes research is because this means that what happens in the Arctic affects us here, affects the lakes here. So these global climate problems, like melting sea ice, impacts us, and we can't just ignore them. So we can't just not talk about climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. I'm, I'm pretty sure that she could have kept going for another half hour easily. <laughs> That's fine. Our next panelist is Dr. Andrew Andy Mahon, uh, also a member of the Institute for Great Lakes Research and professor of biology here at CMU. Dr. Mahon earned his PhD in ecological sciences from Old Dominion University in Virginia in 2007. And his research uses molecular tools to study rare species in both freshwater and marine aquatic environments. And that extends to the early detection of invasive species. And Dr. Mahon is a pioneer in using environmental DNA and meta barcoding technologies to detect Asian species such as um, uh, invasive species such as Asian carp in the Great Lakes. Andy? Oh, thanks, Ian. Um, let me see, does that work right there? Okay, good. Um, I, I'm just gonna mention a couple of areas with, uh, of research that we have ongoing in the labs right now. As uh, Dr. Davison mentioned, we use molecular tools to help us answer problems. 
um, where traditional methods sometimes don't work or fail. Um, we can, in many cases, just like at a crime scene or just like at uh, any of these TV shows that tend to put things in nice 30-minute or hour packages, uh, we can use that information that animals all have or, or plants or any organisms have um, to help answer questions about them, where they are, um, what populations they're a part of. And in that, we do three main areas of research I'll mention right now, the first of which is looking for uh, or doing surveillance or monitoring of uh, species in the Great Lakes, uh, primarily for invasive species. As Seth Herbst mentioned earlier, uh, we need to know where animals are or where these invasive species are. And as soon as we can detect them, it makes it a lot easier and, uh, on the uh, other side of this, a lot cheaper to deal with them. Um, because, obviously, economics is important depending on who you're talking to uh, in, in terms of finding these invasive species. We started off with this looking for big head and silver carp in the Chicago area, trying to figure out how far they'd moved, um, arguing with certain organizations and agencies, telling them that these fish were farther than they were actually able to catch them. Um, we've moved into other areas like looking for grass carp in the Great Lakes Basin. And we moved from being able to just look for one species at a time to looking for everything at a time. So for example, if we were to go take a cup of water no bigger than this right here from Rose Pond, which is the pond right in front of the Student Activity Center, we could analyze that water sample and tell you all the different fish species that are in that pond right now all the different invertebrate species that are in that pond right now. And th this is a method that's been uh, coined meta barcoding. All we're doing is looking for barcodes, just like your commercial products that you buy at a store have a barcode that you beep, beep, scan as you go through the checkout line. All species have certain parts of their DNA that acts like a barcode, and we can measure that, and we can look for that. And we can do that simply by collecting materials that organisms put off in the water, whether it be through their bodily processes or from just skin cells sloughing off. The same as at any um, crime scene. We do that sort of things for invasive species, and it doesn't just have to be fish or crayfish or invertebrate species in the water. We're actually working on a project that's looking for feral swine in Michigan right now. I didn't realize until a few months ago that feral swine had made it to Michigan. Although it's not a shock knowing that my father was out deer hunting in Missouri a few weeks ago or was out setting up deer stands in Michigan a few weeks ago and saw an armadillo for the first time. Armadillo have made it all the way north to Missouri already from uh, uh, Central America, which is spectacularly amazing um, and also bad because, again, these species are not native to the region. Um, on top of doing eDNA, so uh, standard metabarcoding or eDNA techniques, we're also looking at populations of organisms, like the grass carp that was talked about a few times in the previous panel and by our two uh, speakers today. Um, we're looking at things like, are the grass carp in the western basin of Lake Erie related to those that were caught in Dunkirk Harbor in New York? We're also looking at, are the populations of northern snakehead, this really nasty fish that was introduced in uh, uh, the Potomac Basin, near Washington, D.C. in the early 80s that spread all the way to New York. And um, uh, there's a population that's existing in Arkansas right now. Are those fish in Arkansas related to the fish on the East Coast? How far have they spread? And are these populations uh, mixing? Are they the same? And so on and so forth. And we're using some pretty awesome uh, genomic methods, sequencing whole genomes of these fish to try and figure out how those are related to each other. We can also use those data to figure out how many of those fish are actually out there. We can use standard population biology math to calculate the number of fish that are in these populations simply by using DNA from these organisms themselves. And lastly, the last thing I'll mention is some of the uh, uh, other areas of research that we're doing is we're looking at commercial bait shops. We know commercial bait industry in North America is about a billion dollar industry i.e. you go out, you buy minnows, you buy night crawlers to go fishing with. It's a billion dollar industry in, in North America. Well, people tend to dump their bait into the, uh, 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 wherever they're done. And that's one of these very strong uh, public awareness initiatives that has gone out. Um, don't dump your bait. Don't put it into the water uh, after you're done fishing with it. Um, some of the things we've done with that is to look for spread of invasive species with eDNA with that. But we're also looking in these commercial bait tanks, what else is in those tanks? And it's not just fish, it's not just plants. It turns out that there's some pretty nasty pathogens that can be in those water, in, in the water in those commercial bait shops. And we're working on looking at um, what's in those tanks also.
And I think that's that's pretty much the highlights of what we're doing in the lab right now. So. Thank you, Andy. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Kelly Robinson. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Quantitative Fisheries Center in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University, um, as is the next panelist after her. The panelists are organized alphabetically. There's uh, no intention to put the people from MSU at, at the end. Uh, Dr. Robinson earned her PhD in fisheries science is from the University in Georgia in 2011. And her research has focused on the ecology and management of Great Lakes fisheries. Uh, her current research includes studying adaptive management of invasive grass carp uh, in Lake Erie, evaluating decision support tools to prioritize barrier removal in Michigan's rivers, and determining how Great Lakes sculpins have been affected by recent ecosystem changes. Dr. Robinson? Uh, hi, so um, I'm pretty new to the Great Lakes region, so I'm getting an opportunity to learn from everybody else about the research that's going on here, too. Uh, my work is with the Quantitative Fisheries Center, and also I work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission as part of my, uh, my appointment. So I get a lot of opportunity to work in the interface of policy and, and science. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a lot today about part of what my, I've been working on, which is decision analysis and adaptive management. Um, so decision analysis, also known as structured decision making, is just a, a framework that helps us to, to work through a problem in a, in a more strategic manner. Um, and it's a values-based pro process in that we groups and managers to evaluate their objectives. We lay those objectives out first before we start thinking about actions we could take to solve those problems and working through the, the different types of science to predict those, those um, consequences. So this is kind of different from the way that we might usually make a decision when we say, I've got a problem, well, what am I going to do about it? We like to work through it saying, we've got a problem, what do we want to achieve to solve that problem, and then how can we go about achieving those things? Uh, and after we work through those objectives, then we can use ecological and social science to predict the effects of different actions we could take to achieve those objectives. So my example that I'll give you today is something that's been talked about a good bit, which is grass carp in Lake Erie. Um, and most of, most of you have heard a lot about this before. Um, but we were able to gather a group of managers and biologists from around Lake Erie, including federal um, agencies, both from the United States and Canada, um, a few of the state agencies, some researchers from around the, the region, and um, some of the provincial um, offices in Canada as well. And we worked through the, with this group through a series of workshops and some um, work from a postdoc of mine to define the problem and the objectives of this, this, this project. Um, and with a lot of natural resources management problems, we have a couple of different kinds of objectives, the first being ecological, as you might imagine. Um, for grass carp, it was things like population growth and spread and uh, effects of different actions that we might have on different non-target organisms that, w that are also in the lake. But there are also economic and social objectives that we have to consider with a lot of these problems. And these are things like cost of management, but also effects of, of actions or effects of grass carp themselves on stakeholder groups that might be affected. Um, so uh, you can see how Laying out these objectives first helps us to think more broadly about what the effects are of these of these um, problems. So then we laid out some objectives, some actions that we could use to achieve these objectives. Things like targeted removal and impeding migration of the fish as they're moving up to spawn, um, and many others that the group um, has worked with. So now we've created a population model, which is basically just a, a computer model that helps us to simulate the effects of these different actions on our objectives. Um, and particularly for, as they pertain to grass carp growth, population growth and spread. And we're predicting costs and effects of these actions on the stakeholder groups as well, so that we can then make trade-offs among these objectives and come to a, a, a conclusion about what kinds of actions we should take moving forward. And so then with the next steps for this particular project, we're working in, into an adaptive management phase where we can take what we've learned, apply those management actions, and use them in a way that we can actually learn from the system so we can make better decisions the next year as we move on to continue to try to control, to control the species to keep it from spreading. And so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what a lot of the, the um, management actions are that I'm interested in. I also um, have other projects that I've been working on similarly with decision making for natural resources. Uh, 
uh, with the barrier removal project, we have, um, there are a lot of different online decision support tools that people can use to prioritize removing barriers in the Great Lakes region. Um, so Great, Great Lakes has a, a, a large number of barriers, particularly in Michigan is where we're working. Um, these are barriers that are things like dams or just small road stream crossings that can prevent migratory fishes from moving to where they need to complete their life cycle. They also can degrade the water quality. And but they also, a lot of these barriers can serve also as um, barriers for sea lamprey spawning, which is something that's very important for controlling sea lamprey. So uh, how can we use these tools? Uh, which ones are the best to, to be able to, to prioritize barrier removal, taking into, the, into consideration these different pieces of the puzzle? Um, so and with this information, we can then help managers to use these different tools more effectively to be able to, to work through removing barriers. Uh, so those are kinds of the kinds of projects that I've been working on that are most applicable to to this idea of conserving the Great Lakes ecosystems. Well, as some of you are aware, I have a, a more than passing interest in populations of steelhead and salmon in the Great Lakes, and so I'm particularly pleased to introduce our last panelist who is Dr. Michael Siefkis, who is the Sea Lamprey Control Manager for the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, and in addition is an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State. Uh, Dr. Siefkis earned his PhD from Michigan State University, and I, you have that well hidden on the web, I couldn't find out when. <laughs> um, and in addition to managing the, great, the Sea Lamprey Control Program, he conducts and directs research to better understand the unique physiology of sea lampreys and how and to evaluate how that knowledge might be used to develop more effective control techniques. Dr. Siefkis. Great. Thank you. So um, I usually start out these panel talks sort of talking a little bit about a uh, little bit about sea lamprey and um, uh, the reason I do so is that we run into this more and more often at a lot of our outreach events where we get members of the general public especially that come up and they say, oh, sea lampreys, I, I didn't know we had those anymore or, or I thought we didn't have to worry about those anymore. And, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the problems uh, that we face uh, at the commission. So, so I like to spend a little bit of time on the history of, uh, of sea lamprey and where it stands now as far as... Uh, as far as sea lamprey control goes. So I think we all know that uh, sea lampreys are one of, the, one of the first invaders into the Great Lakes that uh, both the governments and the people of Canada and the United States were worried about. Uh, they came in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, uh, most likely through the shipping canals that were built uh, in those times to uh, develop the economy of the Great Lakes area. So. Um, unintended consequences of that were, were obviously the invasion of the lamprey and what they did to the subsequent or did to the uh, the fishery and the economy of the areas uh, within the Great Lakes. So um, basically, overfishing and sea lamprey caused the collapse of commercial and recreational fisheries that sent the economy of the Great Lakes into a pretty devastating downward spiral. Enough so that it prompted the governments of both Canada and the U.S. to uh, convene uh, a meeting of Great Lakes Fisheries and to sign a treaty that formed the Great Lakes Fishery Commission uh, into law as uh, the body that, uh, was re that was responsible for uh, three mandates anyway, to, to conduct and, and uh, implement a program to control the lamprey, also to coordinate fisheries management among the eight Great Lakes states in the province of Ontario and then also to coordinate a program of research uh, to better inform both fisheries management and sea lamprey control. So uh, through the formation of the commission, we were able to form a successful control program for sea lamprey. And since then, we have been able to reduce sea lamprey abundances in the Great Lakes by about 90% from their peak levels. So what that allowed uh, allowed the, the ecosystem to do was to rebound, those fish communities to rebound. Uh, now there's been some other introductions uh, during that time too that have also altered the Great Lakes, but really what it did is it, it allowed for a recreational fishery and a commercial fishery to rebound. And today that's estimated as, va at, as valued at uh, about $7 billion. So 
So just the commission itself and what it's been able to do with fisheries management, sea lamprey control has, has allowed for that economy to rebound within the Great Lakes. So how do we do that? Well, we do that through uh, a couple of different means. The first is that we were able to develop a successful pesticide that targeted larval sea lampreys in their natal streams. And that's applied to these streams in a very coordinated effort with our partners, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, that is the backbone of the sea lamprey control program. We treat about 120 streams a year and uh, we're able to keep those populations in check uh, at about 10% uh, uh, of those peak levels. So uh, the other thing that we use to uh, control lampreys are sea lamprey barriers, and Kelly alluded to this in her introduction. Uh, so we do have important barriers out there that protect uh, streams and tributaries to the Great Lakes from infestation of habitats upstream of those barriers. And those also play a very critical role in sea lamprey control. Um, so we have other, other areas in which we are hoping to, to develop control tactics. And uh, really, that's the research part of this. And um, right now, the commission is, is, is focused on developing additional control tactics that could be used either in place of lamprecides or along, uh, along with lamprecides and barriers to further enhance sea lamprey control. Those have to do with behavioral manipulation uh, uh, means, such as using pheromones and alarm cues to guide sea lamprey behaviors, to get them to spawn in areas where they would be unsuccessful, or in areas where you're more effective at treating, or to lure them into traps. Uh, one of the other things that we're looking to do, and, and again, alluding to the fact that there is a trade-off between having a barrier in a stream to, to uh, uh, block lampreys, uh, and also to allow fish passage, we're working on developing uh, techniques and infrastructure that could allow selective fish passage. And then we also have uh, uh, an area where we're looking at the genetics of lampreys to try and identify those unique physiologies of the lamprey that we could take advantage of. So anyway, in a nutshell, that's where we're at with, uh, with sea lamprey control and the sea lamprey research program. Uh, so we'll stop moving on to the questions and uh, encourage you to keep writing them down if you have any questions. Um, the first one is directed to Daria, but I think uh, any of the panelists can jump in. As, as you showed, um, this year is looking to be a very warm year, uh, following on the record warmest year, uh, with 2015 and 14 being, uh, I think, some of the warmest years on record as well. How will this trend of warming likely affect sea, uh, lake level in the Great Lakes and the ecosystems of, of uh, the Great Lakes? That's a great question, um, whoever asked that. Thank you very much, because I prepped some data just in case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the main, the main way that temperature affects lake levels is through evaporation. So you have to look at your summer temperatures, but also if you have warmer winters, you're not going to form the lake ice, which protects your, your lake levels as well, because then you're not evaporating in the winter. So I double checked and temperatures, let's see, lake level change, um, over the last 100 years, solely based on evaporation. So the good people who model lake level at um, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab estimate that um, 40.6 centimeters have been due to evaporation in the last 100 years. And if you look at the math, about every 0.1 degree C temperature increase um, evaporation will decrease water levels by 1.65 centimeters. So you could calculate it out based on what you think, you know, climate's going to do in the future, um, how that will impact. And that's just from summer evaporation. So that is not taking into account the water usage and, and other ways that we change the lake levels. Thanks. Does anyone else want to jump in about likely effects of global warming on Great Lakes? Don't have an opinion? Okay. Yeah, sure. And uh, there's 
there's been uh, some research that's been done on this as, as far as uh, as far as sea lamprey populations go. We see that adult sea lamprey size in Lake Superior has been increasing with increasing temperatures. And along with that, the fecundity of sea lamprey is also increasing. So um, that could have an impact as far as sea lamprey production goes in the Great Lakes and uh, uh, could cause uh, increased control uh, uh, efforts to be needed in these areas. And then we also see warming trends in, in some of, uh, especially in Lake Superior and some of the sea lamp, the interconnecting waterways such as the St. Mary's River and the Huron Erie Corridor in those areas. And with increasing temperatures, there also could be increasing sea lamprey, uh, sea lamprey production in those areas, which could cause um, um, increased numbers and concern for all parties involved. Okay, thank you. There's a question for uh, Dr. Mahon. Um, so, when you go out and discover uh, the location and extent of a non-indigenous species, um, who do you tell? Where does the information go and what do they do with that information? First off, you get a little more depressed every time, um, <laughs> particularly when it comes to finding Asian carp farther and farther up towards Lake Michigan. Um, most of the time, when we go into to a research project where we try to delineate the extent of an invasion or try to find an invasion front, one of the things we figured out very, very early on when it comes to uh, for when we when it came to the Asian carp project, the Big Head and Silver Carp project in the Chicago area is we needed a communications protocol where if we found something, we had a, a, I, th I believe it was 24 hours to validate our results i.e. we went back and we reran the test. We cleaned everything, we sterilized everything, we had everything brand new, and we repeated the test. That would confirm our detection using the environmental DNA or the genetic methods. We then had a phone tree. I mean, it's just like every, every parent or every, everybody. We had a phone tree. We had 24 hours to then provide a memo to the agency in charge, and most of the time that was a state agency, who was uh, was a lead, and we'd copy the the other organizations, the other management organizations, and we also had as anybody that would receive this information was bound not to talk to other agencies about it until we had a phone conference about it within 48 hours. So it all came down to a communications protocol, and it was really important that people followed this communications protocol. Obviously, there were no legal binding issues with it, but if somebody didn't follow said communication protocol. Um, they wouldn't be allowed to get the results next time. So it, it, was, it, it was a pretty important part of, the, part of the story and part of the information to make sure that somebody who didn't necessarily have all the information on their table didn't go talk to the, the Free Press or the Chicago Tribune or, or some other uh, uh, media outlet before the, the, the information was all out there and on the table. Um, and we had that happen a couple of times to us very early on, hence the implementation of our communications protocol. So this is a question for Dr. Robinson. Um, Somebody is curious to know what trends you've been seeing in sculpin population size and distribution. Oh, that's a good question. So a lot of the work that I've been doing on that is comes from um, trawl data from the USGS surveys that happen in each lake each summer and each fall. And so what they've seen overall is that there's been a very large decrease in abundance and biomass of sculpins in all of the lakes, with the exception that in Lake Ontario, we have seen an increase recently in deepwater sculpin, and this was a species that up until, I would say, probably 10 years ago, we thought was completely extirpated from Lake Ontario. So this is an interesting kind of difference from the rest of the lakes where everybody, everywhere else we're seeing declines in abundance and biomass, um, but in Lake Ontario, they're, they're really increasing. So we're not really sure how to make sense of that. There's some indication that that's, that population may have been recolonized from um, using genetic analyses from the upper lakes. But overall, we're seeing that they are declining. Our um, one caveat is that the time series for this is only goes back to the 1970s. So you know, we've seen a lot of ecosystem changes throughout the, the years in the Great Lakes. So how it's kind of difficult to parse out these new changes and how they're affecting sculpins versus what might have been happening? What was the baseline before 1970 for sculpin? Is this something that is shifting back to normal? Is it something that's, that's, that we should be very concerned about? Um, so there's some questions there. Okay, thank you. So here's someone who is not in academia, to whom the science doesn't necessarily mean very much. Uh, so they like to ask the panel, 
um, for some examples of management decisions and policies that are related to the work they do or work they're aware of. So I'll start with uh, Marcelo, since you haven't said anything for a while. Uh, that's very good. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, for me, the uh, closest example you have seen, it, you heard of it this morning when um, I believe it was Representative Mullinar was uh, uh, telling you about the uh, budget for GLRI, three hundred million dollars, and that's uh, um, that's a policy decision that basically uh, endows. Uh, a lot of research and a lot of remediation efforts in the Great Lakes uh, directly or indirectly supports uh, and signal the interest for of the federal government and uh, of the uh, of the people of the Great Lakes towards uh, the work of uh, my colleagues, um, and uh, that to me is a, is a very tangible way is a very tangible policy right there, um, so. Anyone else like to uh, jump in? So as I mentioned, a lot of my work is directly related to management. Um, one example that I didn't really get a chance to talk about that I think is interesting that has been ongoing at the QFC since way before I, I started working there, but that I'm starting to be involved with is um, the management of perkids in Lake Erie. So these are walleye and yellow perch. And we have a group of stakeholders that are both commercial and recreational fishermen from around Lake Erie, both on the Canadian and the U.S. side, that have met, I think, about 17 times now. We meet about twice a year to discuss um, using these kinds of structured decision-making apparatuses to to um, get this all the stakeholders on the same page for how we should be managing the lake, how and we can use uh, a quantitative methods to, to predict how many, you know, for instance, yellow perch we might expect to see based on the catches from the previous year, and then how can we allocate that to commercial and recreational fishermen in a way that's um, that's helpful for everybody. And it's really been a great process to, to use our science of using these different analyses to analyze the different catch data uh, metrics that we have, and then also applying that to real world problems where we're working with stakeholders to help them to understand what these the science means and how can we fairly allocate catches based on that. Great. I've got a couple of questions that uh, for Dr. Siefkis, and um, I'll kind of combine them. So clearly, sea lamprey control is important, um, but there are potentially negative consequences um, on non-target species for lamprecides and effects of dam removal. How do policymakers balance those costs and benefits of the lamprey control program? Yeah, you know, and that's a that's a difficult question, and uh, uh, certainly something that is uh, uh, well on the minds of uh, everyone at the commission. Because even within our own mandates, uh, between native species restoration and sea lamprey control, you can often be at conflict um, with that in regards to the non-target impacts that some of our control methods have. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, how we how we handle that as far as decision making and policy goes is that uh, the research certainly informs that. Um, uh, since the 1950s, when we first developed the lamprecides that we use, there's been an ongoing uh, uh, set of research that's been looking at uh, trying to hone the protocols and the uh, ways in which we conduct our business uh, to make sure that we have as minimal impact on non-target organisms as possible. And we are uh, we work with our partners, um, our, our state partners, our federal partners, our tribal partners, uh, and all of that information is on the table. And uh, everyone is well aware of the of the threats or the risks of and also the rewards of sea lamprey control. And decisions are made based on those interactions with our management agencies uh, to, to best apply uh, the program in a way uh, that's gonna maximize uh, sea lamprey control but minimize those impacts in those areas. And one of the things that we've done recently, and Kelly is here uh, representing that aspect of things, is in, the, in, those, in those areas where we have really high conflict we bring in experts such as Kelly to work with uh, work with all the partners and agencies involved to make a best decision possible 
uh, for everybody involved. So, and um, that's one of the really exciting things that the commission is doing, especially recently, is engaging in those type of activities. Thank you. So we have someone who's interested in the potential, uh, the project to potentially remove the Sixth Street Dam in Grand Rapids. Um, so the question to the, the panel is, do any of you know anything about where that stands? And from a scientific and management perspective, what would be the consequences of removing that dam? I don't know near as much as some of the other folks in my office, but I know that um, um, that plans are moving forward to remove the Sixth Street Dam. But in its place, uh, the 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 thought and the talk is is that we would build an adjustable crest sort of barrier there that would uh, ultimately prevent, uh, from our perspective anyway, sea lamprey from getting upstream of that barrier. And uh, really, that I believe that this partnership too that uh, that is working on this project has been uh, a really a good model as to how we should go about maybe making these type of decisions. There's a lot of people in the room uh, having a lot of input on what needs to happen to ensure that uh, uh, not only that uh, the recreational opportunities that would be afforded uh, because of this project, um, uh, sea lamprey control plus uh, fisheries habitat restoration in that, in that area, I know there's, uh, there's endangered species issues too, especially with mussels. So I, I think a lot of folks are, are in the room having those conversations and uh, making sure that the, 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 those decisions are being uh, made in the best way possible. Certainly if that barrier were removed and, uh, uh, and sea lamprey from my perspective allowed to infest that system, it could be a game changer in the Great Lakes. Uh, I think there's a, uh, about 2,000, 2,500 or so uh, uh, stream miles up there that could be infested with sea lamprey control. Uh, it would probably take at least uh, a quarter to a third of our budget just to treat that system. So certainly uh, that is a big game changer as far as uh, deciding what to do in that system. But um, other than that, um, I'm, I'm not sure where it stands as far as uh, where we're at in the process. Okay. Anything from the rest of the panel? No, nope. good. So here's a, a question um, that relates to zebra mussels and their role in sort of filtering algae out of the, the Great Lakes. Uh, and the person posing the question asks, are there some invasive species that actually benefit the ecosystem? And I suppose if so, what are they? Andy? <laughs> <laughs> Since you're the invasive species guy. Uh, so <laughs> there are species that can have benefits. For example, the, the gobies in Lake Erie have benefited the endangered water snakes, um, helped those populations of those snakes rebound when their food source was, I believe, taken out by zebra mussels, correct? There, I, I think it was zebra mussels came in. But uh, again, it's like th there's always issues when you bring something in it, it could have cascading effects. Um, if anybody's been to Australia and trying to drive on a road and at late at night, the, the cane toads, there's a really horrible, horrible movie out there, a documentary about uh, the cane toad. The cane toad was brought to Australia to help uh, a, a sugar cane crop, I believe, um, a, a beetle pest. Well, the beetle could climb up the sugar cane and the cane toad cannot. And it was introduced to do such a thing. And I believe, you know, there's always issues like this where these species, um, uh, uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. We brought grass carp, black carp, big head and silver carp to the United States. This was not an accidental release. The EPA man or allowed them to be brought to help in aquaculture. And now we're having issues with them later on. And this was, I think, in the 70s we brought them in. Um, to help in catfish ponds and aquaculture ponds in the uh, lower Midwest. Um, and now we're dealing with the ramifications of that because we could not contain those. Um, and and it, it's things like that that are always going to have to be on the back of people's minds when it comes to invasive species. And, you know, even if it has some potential benefits up front, what about what happens if? That question always needs to be addressed and it always needs to be in the back of people's minds. So, Thank you. Um, recognizing that I don't think anybody's really a chemist here, we have a chemistry question. Um, so what 
chemicals that are being introduced into the Great Lakes and watersheds should we be most concerned about and why? I'm paraphrasing the question. Okay. Do we have any ideas? I mean, we know, and, uh, we know certain prescription medicines are being leached out into water systems. This isn't just a Great Lakes issue. This is a, a global issue. We know microplastics are a huge problem. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that we're uh, we're dealing with in terms of in terms of chemicals. Um, we could talk about oil spills uh, uh, that are a constant threat here in the Great Lakes. I mean, that's I mean that's those are the three things that I can think of right off the top of my head. For someone who shrugs his shoulders when I ask him these questions, he does a pretty good job of answering them. Uh, yeah, I just want to add. Um, well, from the learning experience I had over the past year and a half. While at CMU, I would say uh, oil products. That could be a quite a good, a good answer. Thinking of what happened in Kalamazoo, for instance, um, and and about that was uh, what was interesting to me. Um, it's related to the question. Um, I've been in last June in Cleveland, Ohio. There was the first symposium on the crude oil transportation, uh, organized by Great Lakes Commission, NOAA, U.S. Coast Guards, the Canadian government, uh, NSF, you name it. And um, to me as an economist, it was kind of a surreal symposium because the late motive was we are going to transport more oil and other fossil fuels and chemicals across the Great Lakes. That's, that's given for granted. Um, that's it. Now we have to work out solutions paid by taxpayers uh, to clean up the almost certain emergency that that's going to create. Um, and I found that perspective quite interesting. The fact that we give for granted we're going, we're going to pump more oil, more fossils, more chemicals throughout the Great Lakes, maybe underneath water, maybe not, but, you know, that's going to happen. That's it. You have something to add? Okay. Well, the last question is from me. Um, I thought we'd end with a bit of a fun, but, but also a question that, uh, addresses the challenge of communicating science in a world where people's attention span is significantly less than the people in this audience, where you've spent uh, most of the morning listening to the issues that relate to the Great Lakes. So I've asked the panel to imagine that they have just been appointed as President Trump's senior science advisor. And that's, you know, it's a nice job, you're in DC, good salary. The challenge is, is that the President is only going to uh, entertain input from you in the form of a 140 character tweet. So my question to the panel is what would your first tweet to the president be? Are we going in order? Jump in. Yeah, you're going I, order. I prepared a tweet. Because okay. <laughs> I had to count the characters, of course. So just to say, there would be a tweet storm with all the science and the data, but my first tweet would be this. Uh, quote, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. End quote. Ancient Greek proverb. Hashtag let's get to work. Hashtag peer-reviewed science is not fake news. Hashtag science is coming. Marcelo? Uh, well, it's hard to top that. Um, <laughs> I would I would probably I would probably uh well I don't know uh a tweet would would probably sound like uh um you know I don't know uh I I will take a few minutes if Okay uh, or I can <laughs> play the apprentice <laughs> boss and you'll find Andy <laughs> All right, well, okay. let's go with this. <laughs> Put scientists in science jobs, pay attention to data, hashtag make America sane again. <laughs> Our friends from uh, MSU? I'm sure. <laughs> um, I would say Great Lakes ecosystem management requires continued bipartisan support and a structured values based approach to making decisions. Uh, that's not sad. <laughs> <laughs> and last? 
Well, seeing as I, I don't do any social media at all, so uh, <laughs> um, I, would, I would probably try to do something that would, uh, uh, that would frame, frame at least the Great Lakes region in something that would be comprehensible. Um, I, the, the region itself is, uh, has a GDP of about $6 trillion. And I would tell him that uh, uh, in order to support that, which is probably, if you looked at it, if it by its own company or if it was its own country, it's probably within the top five in the world. I would say you need to support that economy uh, to ensure that that works for America uh, by supporting the research that's going to let us know how to maintain and predict how that ecosystem and economy is going to react in an uncertain future. Yeah, I have mine. <laughs> I would start with three. Hey, hey, you, hey. Attention span of the president is not his strength, so <laughs> need to need to make it focus. Uh, make the Great Lakes your lakes. Fight fake news and anti-science. Put a little bit on this, and then hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Want to make sure. Okay, well, I'd like us to thank our panel. Um, I'm sure if you have any individual questions for them, they'd be happy to uh, answer them. If you come up after the end of the session. And thank you all for coming uh, and participating in this year's conference. Thank you. <laughs>